Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are here for the keynote to begin the day. Uh, we are going to listen Dr. Margaret Ann Story or Peggy. Uh, she's a professor at computer science and the director of the software engineering program at the University of Victoria, and she do research on, on software engineering and human aspects of software engineering. So we are very excited to listen to what she has to talk about bots. That's very intriguing and I admire a lot uh, her work. So I'm very curious to know what she's been doing on that topic. So please, Peggy. Great, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I haven't given my talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> But that was quick. Um, is the mic okay? Yes. So thank you for inviting me for giving a keynote here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be at this conference. I haven't actually been at it before, but I've read many of the papers and I know quite a few of you. So, and it's a lovely community. I, I have to say I was really impressed with the dinner last night. And yeah, very nice. I'm glad it's going to be at ICSI next year because it'll make it easier, I think, for more people to go and benefit. Um, so as uh, Marco said, I've been doing research on social media. I'm going to talk about bots today. And um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the people that I've been chatting with about this topic because it's a, it's a brand new topic. Um, Alexei Sagaski and Carlene LeBuff are two students in my group and we've been chatting a lot about uh, these bots and learning about them and exploring them and also having some conversations with, uh, or actually some early research with Alexander Sarabranek and Ben Lin from Eindhoven on looking at how developers use Slack and the kinds of bots that they use. So I just want to acknowledge them because their ideas and their thoughts uh, are certainly in this talk. Um, so, so I think a lot of people pretty much know what bots are these days, but I get a lot of questions. Well, what really are they? You know, so there is sort of a, some confusion about them, and I will try to give sort of a definition about what bots are, but maybe together we could refine that uh, afterwards, maybe during the coffee break. Um, but there, Slack is, uh, for those of us in software engineering, a lot of us have heard about Slack. Many people here are using Slack. Few, how many people know about the integrations and the bots that are in Slack? Okay, so if you're using Slack, you kind of know about these, and they're they're really um, very very popular and very helpful in, in helping you do the tasks that you do in software development. And Kevin Kelly, in his book, he talks about that you'll be paid in the future based on how well you work with robots. So he's predicting that in the future, how we work with robots, whether they're real robots or software ro uh, bots, is really going to impact how we work. Um, this developer, I don't know if you saw this article, um, he, his name was uh, Philida Fish, and uh, he took this a bit too seriously. And I think he started working in the Bay Area as a software quality engineer, and it took him about eight months to fully automate his job. Hmm. And then he spent the, the next six years sitting in his office playing games. Um, and then he posted about it on Reddit, <laughs> that he was doing it, and then he lost his job. <laughs> um, and the really sad thing about this is that he said, oh, you know, I've forgotten how to program <laughs> right after six years. So um, this notion of being able to automate your job is, you know, is not that far away. There are possibilities and there are pieces of it that you can automate. So why did I start looking at bots? So since 2007, I've been very interested in social media and social tools, so I started looking at tagging and trying to understand how the impact of these tools, these, these features in the, in the tools that developers use or the communication channels that they use, how do these features really impact how developers work themselves and how they connect with other people and how they form this uh, sort of social participatory culture that they work in. And uh, some of the studies that we've done, so we've looked at how developers use Twitter and how they use YouTube, for sharing uh, tacit knowledge in YouTube, how they coordinate with code on GitHub. We've done all these different studies. And in 2013, the end of 2013, we ran a large survey. And uh, over the next three years, we ran it over three years, we collected all these responses from developers to ask them about the tools that they were using, in particular focusing on the kinds of social features that they were using. And this tool called Slack came up in our, you know, the other, you know, the other field, right? And we're like, Slack? What is that? 
Um, and what was interesting to us was that we analyzed the data that we got from all of these developers and they shared with us a lot of cha channel challenges that they were having. So they were having challenges to do with being disrupted and being overwhelmed with notification and they were facing challenges working with developers across the world when they spoke different languages and different time zones. And they had challenges in terms of their, uh, the fragmentation of the tools uh, that they were using as well and information being fragmented across these different tools. And what was interesting was that in the survey, the developers that were talking about Slack were actually telling us through the open-ended responses how they were using Slack to address those challenges. But there was only a few of them. And so that was in 2013, and we saw that increase a little bit in 2014 and 2015. So we became interested in this. What, how is Slack being used? And so we did a, an initial study, and it was uh, presented at CSCW this year as a poster paper. Um, I, I will share slides with you, by the way, at the end, and so you can get links to these papers as well. Um, and I tend to talk fast, so that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so what we found from this initial study is that developers use these bots or these integrations with these other channels for things like you know, uh, de development support and social media and for communication and service and for fun. And I'll go into those, uh, those categories a bit more later on in my talk and try to kind of flesh those out a bit more. So that's what brought me into sort of being intrigued about bots. Um, and so today, when David and Marco asked me to give this talk, I was kind of sick of talking about the old stuff that I'd been talking about. So I thought, oh, I'll talk about bots. Um, so I had to do a, a ton of reading and reading blogs and trying to understand you know, what, what is going on with this bots thing. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. So it's a bit of a kind of a brain dump okay, that I'm going to give you here. So during the talk, we're going to talk about, well, what is a bot? Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history. We're going to talk about how bots play a role in software engineering in particular. Um, and then we'll talk about how can we enhance maybe software development with bots, so what are the benefits that we're seeing through there. And then we'll talk about some of the risks maybe from using them or overusing them, as well as some research opportunities. And I think there's tons of research opportunities, so very exciting to <coughs> So what is a bot? So this is one definition. This is actually Carly's definition that she had on her slides. So a bot is an application that performs automated, repetitive, predefined tasks. Um, and it could be anything from setting an alarm to telling you today's weather to maybe gathering and broadcasting information. So that's a pretty informal definition. But let's go back in time. So we all know about the Turing test, right? Um, so Eliza was sort of one of the first attempts. It was one of the first chat bots back in 1966. Um, that created this, uh, this chatbot that tried to mimic a human being, right? And it was uh, you know, modeled after a Rogerian uh, psychotherapist. And it was pretty, it was pretty amazing, right, uh, Eliza? Many people know about Eliza. Not too, not too many people. Anyway, you can read about it. it was, for the time, it was pretty advanced. And people really enjoyed playing with it and, and enjoyed kind of the interactions that they would have with it. Basically, she would just, you know, repeat back to you what you said. You know, if you said you're feeling sad, then why are you feeling sad? You know, those kinds of things, right? Um, and then in 1988, IRC came along, and a developer of IRC um, had the code as open source and also had some code for creating bots in, uh, in IRC, um, chatbots in IRC. And so this gave a platform and a language for writing your own bots. And developers did. They wrote a lot of different bots, and they had a lot of fun with it. So there was a bartender bot in IRC, um, and other bots that did useful things. And you could add these bots to different channels in IRC. So IRC is a, is a chat, a messaging platform, a chatting platform. Um, of course, bots, when some people think about bots, this is the kind of thing that you think about. Sorry to offend your eyes so early in the morning. We don't really see these so many any, uh, anymore, so much anymore. Um, but this sort of idea of bots kind of you know, tracking you and sort of you know, stalking you and getting your information or spamming you is, is, is a lot of what people think about when you talk about bots. But today, there's much more than that, and I'll get into that. This is more what bots today look like. So if you're reading the news, um, these bots are being uh, hosted on messaging platforms, such as this is on Facebook. Oh. And this is the kind of thing that you see that you would be able to interact with this bot and do something like order a burger. So in terms of bots and chatbots, uh, did, we did a, a search on Google Trends, and you can see that the term chatbot, so this is where we are here, and this is like 2011, 2012, 2013, 2015 is here, 
there's this spike in this last year, in 2016, of discussion sort of in the, the, the blogosphere about chatbots. Bots are still sort of pretty even, but chatbots are just really taking off in the last uh, few weeks. Um, so how do we go about defining bots? So we struggled with this quite a bit. We've had quite a few uh, discussions about this in our research group. I mean, a script, you know, a daemon script is a kind of a bot, right? It's a process that sits and waits for something and then does something. Um, and agents, you know, these intelligent agents that from expert systems, apps to the integrations that you have in Slack where you integrate, you know, if you push uh, your changes or commit your changes to GitHub, you can integrate that in Slack and have a channel that shows you all of the integrations in GitHub. Um, to bots where you have this conversational user interface. So this is kind of long continuum and long history, right, going way back. So one definition perhaps is that they provide conduits between users and services typically through a conversational UI. So that's maybe one start of a definition. But there are many different dimensions to bots. So we could look at what they do, how autonomous they are, how intelligent, how we interact with them, where they live, okay, where, where you're going to bump up against them and interact with them, and how they are actually created. So in terms of what they do, I already kind of alluded to this bad bot, you know, good bot kind of thing. Um, so I, I, I'm going to focus on this. You know, yeah, there are some out there that you know do this stuff, but this is not the focus of uh, of my talk today. Although even some of these bad bots may use conversation, so they may mimic to be a user and try to trick users and talk to them to get information from them. Um, but I'm going to focus on these ones and, and focus more on the bots that have conversation in them. Um, and the kinds of bots that you get out there is you, there could be crawlers, there could be transactional bots, there may be bots to, to play games and so on. So in terms of how autonomous they are, you could think of them in terms of this push or this pull mode. So in terms of a pull mode, the user initiates the interaction. So with the mbot through Facebook, through the Facebook <coughs> messaging system, the user might say, hey, I want to order some flowers. Or it may be a push mode where the bot is sort of waiting and monitoring something. Maybe it's watching the weather and it sees that it's going to rain today and it's going to push to you uh, an interaction and tell you that you should pack an umbrella when you go, go out today. Or you may have a combination of both. So bots can, will tend to have sort of one of these three things. And then in terms of how intelligent they are, you can kind of think of these again in two different classes. So some bots follow pretty simple rules, so pretty simple logic trees. Um, and they'll do things, you know, if this event occurs, then you do this, right? Or if this occurs, do this other thing. Um, and in some cases, they will, if they get an interaction or they have something, they hit against something that they're not sure what to do, they'll pass the control to the humans, <coughs> and that may be programmed into the bot. And then there are more intelligent bots that use natural language processing and AI, and then learn over time, and then uh, do more things. They're more autonomous as well. Okay, interacting with the user. And Siri is sort of one of the examples of this, these more intelligent bots that try to learn over time. And there's a discussion about this in, these, in this link. Then the next dimension is, well, how to interact with bots. And today, the primary interaction mode is through conversation, through these messaging platforms. And there are subtle differences in the UI and how they do that, you know, if they use cards or how they use you know, different features in the user interface, such as swim lanes and so on. But a key thing in these conversational UIs is the personality. And I really like this quote in conversational UIs, personality is the new UX. And it's pretty interesting to look at the different personalities that these bots have and how that affects how people interact with them. So Poncho is a weather app, or a weather bot, sorry. And um, uh, it's really fun. And people like interacting with it because it's fun and it's humorous and it's kind of whimsical. And it's just the weather, right, after all. Um, but there's also some interesting things that the way that people talk to these bots change based on the gender of the bot, even when they know that it's just you know, a program. So if the bot is a female or if it's a male, there's the way that users talk to it changes. So that is kind of surprising to me. But what happens. And of course, whether the kind of metaphor that's used, you know, whether it's a, a robot or whether it's a wizard or you know, a genie in the lamp or how, that will again affect how people interact with it and the ways of interaction. So the next dimension is where bots dwell. So some bots may sort of dwell in the internet at large or they may dwell in a particular platform. And of course, all the big companies probably you know, want you to be in their platform using their bot frameworks, right, or bots that, that reside in their platforms. 
Um, what's interesting is that Facebook um, just released their, um, their infrastructure for creating bots, and, and within three months, they had 11,000 bots that developers created. Now, that doesn't mean that bot the develop or users were using them. Um, in fact, the uptake has been a bit slower than that, but it's still showing what's coming, right, in terms of the, uh, the trajectory on this. Here's an example from Microsoft, so Cortana. And I like this quote from uh, the, the Microsoft literature on this. So the operating system of the future isn't Windows, but conversation as a platform. So they're really pushing this as well. And uh, Andy May <laughs> is smiling. <laughs> he knows something I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, and then Facebook um, aims to replace your apps one bot at a time. So I mentioned that with the Facebook M um, me uh, bot, uh, messaging, system that you can, instead of going to your app to order flowers for your mother's birthday, you can instead converse with the bot through your messaging tool and converse with this bot and it will order the flowers for you. Or it may even remind you and say, hey, it's your mother's birthday or you know, your husband's birthday next week, would you like to order you know, these flowers? Right? Um, and then of course Amazon and Google, so Amazon has you know, Alexa and the speakers and Deezer, Deezer hasn't been bought yet but they have the speakers in there so that's coming, they're, they're realizing this is a trend. And Google, instead of just searching, now you can also uh, do more than just search but you can actually take an action, right? So you can search for what movies are in the neighborhood and the bot in Google will interact with you and ask you do you want to buy the tickets and here they are. So, and then how they're created. So there's lots of different frameworks out there. Um, so Howdy, for example, la launched a bot kit. Um, it's a framework or a library for building blocks for, or building blocks for building Slack bots, it's a mouthful, <laughs> um, on Slack. And uh, they give you quite a nice tutorial on how to go through and do that. Uh, Microsoft Bot Connector. And all of these require this API and also this developer ecosystem, right? And it's this bottom-up kind of growth, right, that's occurring in terms of the bots that are being built and the features that are available. Um, last night, I saw a tweet about this. Uh, this is just a, a new book that's just out. It's $10 ebook. Um, I haven't read it yet. I just read the first couple of chapters. It looks interesting about how to build uh, Slack bots. Um, and so lots of uh, frameworks are coming at, at, to build Slack uh, bots and Slack. Ubot uses uh, JavaScript, for example, so you can uh, build your bots there. So how do bots, so I've talked about sort of more general use of bots, but how do bots play a role in software engineering? So automation, of course, in software engineering these days is key, right? And scaling projects to thousands of developers, and this is something that you guys all care about, right, in this community. How do we do this, right? How do we scale this? these uh, very large projects with very, very complex um, systems and interactions. How do we do that? And, and automation is the way to do that. And in fact, bots are bringing um, a lot of that support for the automation to within software development uh, processes. And so um, we've been speculating on the different kinds of roles that bots may play in software development, just like you may wonder what kind of developer roles there are. And we talk about these in an in a upcoming paper that we'll present at FSC and the Visions Track this year. And these categories were also inspired by a, a talk by Sven Peters. Sorry, there's an S missing there. And uh, he gives quite an interesting talk on the different classes of bots too. So if you're interested, you might want to look at his talk. So on the one hand, we have code bots. Or maybe we should call these integration bots because a lot of these things do integrations. But they aim to make coding more efficient and more effective through integration of services and also through task automation. So you have bots that will commit your code automatically for you after it's, say, being reviewed or being tested. There are bots uh, such as BugBot, which will create bugs or even update bugs. Uh, once you've committed the code that fixes a particular issue, it will commit that code uh, or update that issue. Um, there are bots that will facilitate a peer review or even do some you know, simple peer review of the code. Um, uh, by facilitating peer review, they may go out and find reviewers who, who has reviewed this code before, who's uh, worked on this code or related code before. And there are bots that will help with automatically merging pull requests, um, such as uh, with continuous integration. And I mentioned Hubot already, so Hubot is being used a lot uh, to support different kinds of coding activities and it, it provides this uh, support for creating your own bots through writing some JavaScript. And uh, there's an interesting article on this that uh, the most important startup's hardest worker isn't a person, it's actually a bot, because they're doing most of the work. 
Okay, looking at testing. So a lot of bots to help with testing here. So there are some bots that will help detect bugs or uh, code quality issues. So find bugs, for example, will run some static analysis tools and will uh, automatically find these bugs and then through the messaging platform will tell the developer, hey, you know, the code you're working on or the co code you just committed has this quality issue. Do you, maybe you should address it. Um, or they may actually open issues uh, directly. So in the Atlassian system, Freud will notice that there's a code quality issue and they'll open an issue and they'll assign it to the developer that created that code quality uh, concern. Or you may have some bots that monitor technical debt over time. So they look at what's happening to the system and perhaps let managers know that the technical debt is going up. Um, there's even a bot, again, in the Atlassian system for testing UI changes. It's a compare bot. So when a change is made to the code that changes the user interface, it will um, do a diff just between the two screens and then let you know that, oh, this change you did has made a change in your user interface. <coughs> did you intend that to happen? Um, also bots to detect flaky tests. Um, so uh, again, this bot, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it detects when you have a test that sometimes passes and sometimes fails. And what it'll do, these flaky tests uh, tend to slow down development and they're very costly. Um, what this bot will do is it will quarantine that test and it will open an issue and then assign it to somebody to go and look at it so that they don't slow down the velocity of the code getting committed to the project. Um, and also a bot to balance tests um, across different uh, systems um, and different servers. Uh, coveralls is one example of such a testing bot. Actually, coveralls is a service. Um, in fact, many of the, the bots that I'm talking about are services that are then sort of revealed or, you know, I, yeah, I guess revealed or used through this conversational user interface to the developer. So coveralls looks at when you uh, work on, when you commit some new code, it checks, um, or do you still have good coverage in terms of your test cases? And if you don't, the bot will let you know that you need to, do, you need to address that. And then uh, DevOps uh, bots. Uh, so we heard about DevOps a bit yesterday from Sabrina. Um, so I really like this quote. Um, so DevOps, um, when you have bots supporting DevOps, they're typically called chat ops. Um, this is a very difficult uh, talk to give first thing in the morning. <laughs> a lot of uh, tongue twisters. Um, but chat ops, um, according to Jesse Newland from GitHub, are putting tools right in the middle of the conversation. So how developers talk to each other and how they build awareness and coordinate is really important. And these bots are actually bringing what's happening with these tools right into the conversation that developers are having. So it's pretty amazing, I think, that they do this. And they can help teams manage complex build deployment from within their chat environment. So from within their chat environment, they can run commands and deploy their system and, and deploy you know, uh, processes that will monitor and will assign issues and so on. And some of the benefits here is that stakeholders on the project, they gain awareness while learning how to do uh, de deployments themselves or to use these features. Um, so by watching what other developers are doing and watching what kind of commands they run as they're, as they're working with their system, they see, oh, that's the command that you use for doing this. And so they not only get to see that what, what everybody else is doing on the, on the team in terms of the project, um, but they also get to learn how to do it themselves. So I think this is pretty powerful. Um, they can monitor the running systems um, and services through DevOps. And so anytime something can't, goes wrong, the way that they find out is they get a message um, through, through their messaging platform. Actually, I did a, a, a little bit of an aside, but we did an interview with a small startup company, a very successful startup company in Victoria. And they use Slack for everything. Everything that they do, every interaction, goes through bots through Slack. Even if you want to go visit them and you ring their doorbell, they get a message on Slack that you just rang their doorbell. Okay. If you want to order food, they use Slack. Mm -hmm. If you want people to test their code, they use Slack. If their users want to interact or send them messages, it comes through Slack. If their services go down, they learn about this through Slack. And when, I, when they were saying this, I said to them, what happens if Slack goes down? Mm -hmm. And the, literally, they went pale. <laughs> <laughs> And they said, well, it would be like turning the lights out on our company. <laughs> so anyway, you can take it too far, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But just to give you the, an idea of you know, how powerful and how, how, uh, how they're being used. Um, and they can also measure and analyze workflow and improve feedback to the team on, on terms of what's going on and term and time and so on. Um, if you're interested in looking at one, PagerDuty is one that you might want to look at that supports DevOps. 
and it basically it takes care of you know where you're getting your messages and your issues are coming from and, and then how those are aggregated and then how those are funneled out to people on the project to deal with those issues. Um, and yeah, I like this quote. So chatting with your infrastructure might seem strange at first, but it's easy to see the benefits, a timeline of who's deploying what and deployments that are so easy anyone can trigger them. So that's just kind of reinforcing what I said already. Um, and then there are support bots. So I mentioned this company that we uh, did interviews with. They were using uh, Slack again, and actually lots of companies are doing this for um, dealing with support from their end users. And this is pretty amazing because you know dealing with uh, users when you have so many users of your product, you, you face a scalability issue, right? So so many and many of the users will ask the same question over and over again. So many companies are looking at using bots. Actually, you guys have probably interacted with bots, right? On systems like you know maybe your telephone system um, and so on. That you you see this you know this automated person, you know this automated bot will answer some of your questions and very very quickly it puts you to a human being, but. Um, but you'll see that. And uh, these kind of support bots will answer frequently asked questions. And furthermore, they'll even do more than that. They'll consult um, the knowledge base to give answers, but then as they get new questions, and maybe as the human steps in and perhaps gives a resource to how to answer that question, the bot will then be watching that and will update the knowledge base so the next time they get that question, they can deal with it. And what's really cool about this is that these bots can be analyzing the user feedback as it comes in and helping to identify what are the biggest issues that users are really upset about, perhaps using sentiment analysis, and then tri triage or triage the most important bugs to fix and perhaps even directly go and open issues. Maybe you have a bot talking to a bot, bot to bot interaction happening there. Um, this is an example of a support bot, again, from the Atlassian system. So this is Hercules. And Hercules, you know, when customers add their logs to a support ticket, Hercules scans them against the database of regular expressions looking for matches to previously known issues. So it's pretty powerful what it can do. Then there are documentation bots. Um, so bots that produce documentation from developer artifacts. So for example, when you commit your code, you add a message to it. So um, there's a bot that will actually author, automatically author release notes from the commit messages that developers have added to their commit, commit uh, commits that they've done. And I guess a, ben a side benefit of that is that these commit messages then may be better if developers know that those commit messages are going to actually appear in the release notes. Um, and there are bots coming that integrate analytics and visualizations into reports and dashboards. Actually, I think I made that up. Okay. That could come. That, that could be happening. <laughs> So some of the things that I'm actually talking about today, there are sort of examples, and I'm sort of also pushing the boundaries a little bit and saying, but they could do this. So that's one of those. Um, there are bots, though, that do translation on the fly, and start, we're starting to see those services being used in software development as well. Um, so these bots are being used to, to uh, translate conversations between developers. It means there's a bot in Skype, right, that does translation. Um, and to find an answer or aggregate answers or documentation <coughs> for the community, authored resources such as Stack Overflow and, uh, or YouTube. Um, this is just one example of a translate bot. And this bot interface actually shows the kind of the command language that's used. <coughs> so there are sort of specific commands and the bot knows that you are issuing a command when you do a forward slash. Um, so you know, this is one variant on the conversational user interface where it's more, but more like a scripting language, I guess, than a, than a conversation. Um, and then this is a, an, an example that isn't just using commands, but is actually doing natural language parse, parsing. It's a, it's a research project. It was presented as a short paper at Kai this year where they created a bot in Stack Overflow that was watching what users were asking and then suggesting resources that the user could go to. And so this is an example of the, the bot at play there. And their, their research shows that there's some really some good potential there. Um, and then there's entertainment bots. <laughs> um, so I use Slack uh, in the classroom, and I integrate bots in the classroom, and I teach. My students are always like, add Giphy. You know, we want Giphy, right? This is Giphy. And I'm like, what? Like, really? Are you guys 10? <laughs> and, but they love Giphy, you know? And they love these fun things. And, and developers love these fun things. You know, it, it, it makes their day better, right? It's more enjoyable. And, uh, and they use bots for things like ordering lunch. You know, they'll have a bot that orders lunch for them and so on. So 
Um, I mean, you could just discard it and say that this isn't important, but I think in terms of well-being of developers and teams, that these kinds of things are pretty important. Um, so these were the, uh, the bot roles that I talked about in software development. And of course, I haven't sort of pulled it out, but collaboration is something that cross-cuts all of these, right? It's kind of this underlying theme to all of these uh, different kind of roles. And um, so chat ops, here's another quote that I like. So chat ops, so that's the, the bots for DevOps, um, is a collaboration model that connects people, tools, processes, and automation into a transparent workflow. So you can actually see what's happening between the people working together and how they're using the tools and the workflow between them. Um, and these are three things, of course, you know, the 3C model, awareness, coordination, and communication. All of these bots, you can see how they bring perhaps elements of awareness and also support coordination. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a bit. And I also like this uh, quote, the team with the most situational awareness wins. So again, this sort of transparent workflow that you get through these platforms brings that awareness, right? That situational awareness to the team. So people can see when they're on the platform that there's, you know, some services down or some particular uh, user issue is coming in, you know, very fast and users are complaining about it. Um, and Slack, of course, through all of its different integrations with all of its different tools is what makes this awareness possible, right? You have all these, uh, these different ways of integrating with all these tools that then allow users to see, oh, somebody just added a new file to Dropbox that maybe I should read, or there's been more commits on GitHub, or does this fail you know, in the continuous or in the build process. Um, and Howdy, I mentioned Howdy already. Um, so Howdy um, um, is, uh, is providing a platform right, for Slack for creating uh, bots. And in terms of team, you know, it provides support for stand-ups and for automated meetings, and here's the lunch orders I mentioned, and uh, training your bot also to ask custom questions. And I like this quote. Howdy has helped me keep tabs on my team of 45 sp spread across three locations. With Howdy, we save hours per week, and we get right to the most urgent needs of the group. I've learned something every time I've done a check-in. So that's kind of the, the, the emphasis from this group across three locations, that it's bringing benefit to them. Um, and the, the real potential of bots doesn't really come, of course, from just one user using them. So it really comes from multiple people using the bots, right? And from people seeing how everybody else is using them. So the more kind of buy-in you get from people in the team, the more benefit that they get from doing that. Um, and this quote talks about this, and it, it just sort of talks about the evolution of how humans interact with technology. It's cognitively ergonomic, this kind of messaging platform. So what about looking at enhancing uh, software development with bots, and, and in particular, I mean, global software development, uh, of course, is you know, key here as well. Um, so one issue is, well, how do you go about designing these bots? And there are actually uh, quite a good uh, amount of uh, principles and, and uh, documents and blog posts that are out there that, just, that will give you advice on how to do a good job on building these bots. Um, and what's interesting is that people tend to, when they're, when they're dealing with a responsive computer program, they tend to um, th uh, assume that it has more intelligence than it really has. Right? And they enjoy talking to it, right? Um, so you'll see the way that people use bots is that you know, they need to, they'll feel that they need to say thank you <laughs> right? when the bot does something for them. Um, we use bots in my own research group, and um, my student Alexei uh, wrote a bot that just asks us at the end of the week, what did you achieve this week? What went well at the end of this? You know, what, did you, what went well this week? And I, find was, and I asked him once, I said, you know, do you do anything with the answers that we put in there? And he goes, no, no, don't do anything. And I still write a response to it. I'm like, why do I do that? You know, so there's something there, right? The way that we interact with it is pretty interesting. Um, but in terms of designing them, the metaphor I already talked about, that really matters. Um, the writing matters. So a lot of user interface design before was, you know, how, how good your graphical um, skills were, right? Um, but now, are, now the big emphasis on how well you can write, okay? and how you can, you know, craft those answers and craft those questions. Um, an interesting thing came up in my research group when we were talking about this is, you know, are some of these things, you know, just the command line? Right? Especially when you're just you're putting in the command anyway, what's the big difference, right? But or is it a conversational UI? Some of them definitely are conversational, but some of them are more like a command line and yet we treat it like it's 
you know, some kind of entity, right, an alive thing, right, uh, because it's in the messaging platform. Um, and as I said, there's lots of principles, and I just put a few here to give you an example. So build in a kill switch <laughs> uh, is one. Avoid rhetorical questions. Users don't like that. Um, and watch for notification overloads. So just some of the things to watch for. But there's many blog posts out there on how to go about doing this. And then as a researcher, I'm kind of curious, well, what are these bots really doing, right? You know, sort of at a more kind of abstract or theoretical level, what, what benefits are they bringing? You know, how, how could we evaluate how a team is using these bots? Or how could we recommend, you know, say, if somebody comes to me and says, well, which bots should we use in my organization? It looks like this, and we have these many developers. How would we go about just, you know, recommending to them which of these bots they should use and which ones they shouldn't? So we're, we're just starting to do that. That's uh, the work that we've been doing is starting to do some interviews with companies and starting to try to understand how they're using these bots. And I'm proposing a, eh, I'm calling it a pro productivity framework. Maybe it'll change <laughs> tomorrow um, or today <laughs> after talking to you guys um, to sort of think about what is it these bots bring? What are the benefits these bots bring? So we can think about productivity. I like this uh, discussion of productivity in this blog post in terms of efficiency, which is getting the things that you need to, done, get, get, need to get done faster. Um, or you could think of it in terms of effectiveness, so achieving work towards your meaningful goals. So as a developer, you know, efficiency is you know, getting your commits, right? So productivity actually in a lot of our research studies are, are, is measured in terms of the number of commits or the number of closed issues. Um, but for the developer, you know, they may care about that, but they may also care about learning. Right? They may care about learning new skills or connecting <laughs> with other developers, right? rather than just doing things faster. So their goal may be, yes, to achieve higher quality on the project, but another goal may be their own image, because maybe they're interested in switching companies down the road. So how do they look to the outside world? So I think it's important to think about these two things. And in terms of efficiency, what do I mean by that? And how do bots play a role there? Well, they can automate these tedious tasks or repetitive tasks. Talked about some of those. They can also help the developers stay in flow. So uh, flow describes the state that developers get into when they kind of you know, ignore everything and just get coding and you know, the passage of time passes away. And the bots can help them you know, not uh, fall out of flow by automating some of the steps and, and stopping them from having to context switch, say from Slack where they're talking to somebody into GitHub. Right? Um, so these bots actually will eliminate and uh, provide support for context switching if they do that. So that's efficiency. And then in terms of effectiveness, um, the, maybe the bots can help improve decision making. Um, they, all, they capture and analyze all of this data right, that we have at our fingertips. Um, I'm not, I don't have evidence to say that they do help this or you know, research that says this. It ha it's such a new topic hasn't been looked at, but perhaps they can. And perhaps they can improve this decision making by sharing that knowledge right across the team, so faster uh, velocity of knowledge going across team members. Um, we see definitely signs of them supporting team cognition by providing that situational awareness that I talked about already, especially with DevOps, and supporting team communication, so developers talk to each other more often, particularly in disparate uh, uh, locations through these, these platforms, because it's easy to do that. And that's where everybody is. And they could also perhaps regulate individual and team tasks and goals. So what do I mean by regulate? So um, my student, Margie, um, is working on this theory of regulation. And we have just a short paper at Chase on this from last year. She's uh, working on a new paper uh, right now as well, as well as her thesis. And this theory of regulation looks at how uh, members regulate themselves, how they regulate each other. Okay, so if Tao and I were working together, it would be, you know, what are you working on? And you would be aware of what I'm working on, and we would have agreement on which tasks. Or about how we have shared regulations. So as a community, we have shared goals, that we want to do research that will benefit developers working in global situations. So these three different kinds of regulation are quite important. And for each of these three different kinds of regulation, there are different processes that must go on. So uh, you need to have task understanding. What is the task that I need to do? And then in relation to that task, what goals am I working towards? You know, maybe, I mean, we always assume developers want to submit the, you know, commit the highest quality co code, but maybe that's not their primary thing. Right? Um, 
And then how you go about it, and then this monitoring and evaluation step, and then finally adapting. And these processes actually occur at all three levels of regulation. And so we've been doing studies of regulation and looking at how tools support these different kinds of regulation. And so I thought I'd look at that in terms of um, bots. So how could bots help with those three different types of regulation? So maybe they can help with initiating, well they do, actually I already use Slack bots to do reminders for me. Um, so maybe they can initiate and track reminders, uh, they can support coordination across tasks, you can use them to visualize progress, so some bots create you know, Gantt charts and so on, and you can even use them to promote and adapt to a team culture. So you can use uh, you know, sentiment analysis and so on to see what's happening in the culture of how people talk to each other. Here's an example of a bot called Felix that does self-regulation. And they even specify, you know, it's for you to stay focused on the tasks that really matter to you today. Just tell them your top goals for today and then cross them off your list. And it only works for those that direct message him um, on a, a tool like Slack. And it's not a team to-do to do list. It helps you plan your day effectively. So this particular bot is really focused on that self-regulation aspect. And here are the examples of some of the commands that you can give Felix. Um, in terms of co-regulation, an example that supports co-regulation here is Nikabot. And so every day, Nikabot asks each member of your Slack team one question. What project did you work on yesterday? Okay. And then she then gathers the information and creates accurate Gantt charts and reports with the data split by time, project, and person. So that's kind of at the level of the, the co-regulation. And then for shared regulation, there are bots like Geekbot, so this is called the, uh, the stand-up guy. And Geekbot, they say it's the first ever, but there are actually others that do this, and I don't know which one was first. But it's a Slackbot assistant that helps you set up real-time asynchronous stand-up meetings. So again, helping towards getting towards that shared regulation where people share their goals and make sure that they're on the same page. Here's another example um, of, a, of a tool that I think provides shared regulation. Or actually, maybe this is more co-regulation. Um, so this is Meekin, and Meekin, <coughs> Jason writes to Meekin, the, the bot, and says we need a quick phone call tomorrow, and Meekin checks everybody's calendars and then suggests a time and says this is the best option, and then somebody else jumps in and says, yeah, this, this time slot looks good, and Jason says, yeah, book it, and then Meekin says, great, I'm booking it tomorrow, and uh, you know, puts it, adds it to everybody, everybody's calendar and syncs their calendars. So I really wish I had this in my university. <laughs> Um, but we're years away from this. I can't even get people to use GitHub in my department. So anyway, share <laughs> regulation through a bot. So what about some looking at some risks and research opportunities? So I've kind of been pushing this, you know, every day is sunny when you use bots. You know, everything is great and everything will be better, right? But of course, you know, no matter what tool we use or no matter what process we follow, if we overuse it or if we don't use it right or in the right context, some issues may occur. So I just wanted to kind of surface some of those here. So will bots change how people relate to one another? This is, I don't know, this is future research. I don't know the question to that in terms of how bots will change how developers talk to one another. There's certainly research that has looked at how other people, children and teenagers and other knowledge workers, how they change how they talk to each other when they use technology or use the computer. And um, you know, Sherry Turkle says that children are learning that it's safer to talk to a computer than to another human. Um, and uh, there's you know, cases in, uh, what's the name of it? Emotion AI or something. There's a bot that uh, teenagers um, in Asia use when they're lonely and they chat to this bot, right? Because it's better to talk to a robot than to nobody else, right? So if you're lonely, it's better. I guess that's why I talked to you bot on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> My students have gone home by then. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, it's better to talk to a robot than somebody else, but if that's overused, what will happen? Will I not talk to my students as much if I'm, you know, using Slack? And then what ethical framework should we use for bots? Um, so, you know, is deception okay? So there was a, a case at Georgia Tech where uh, a professor was teaching a MOOC, and maybe some of you heard about this, and there was uh, one of the teaching assistants was a bot, and uh, the students, I think she was called Alice, and the students didn't know. And uh, Alice was answering, you know, all those stupid questions that the students ask you over and over and over again, right? You know, where's the assignment? What's the due date, right? 
Um, and uh, she actually got really good ratings from the students. <laughs> um, and the students didn't know, right? So is that OK? You know, If we are using bots with our users, is it OK if they don't know it's a real bot or not? Um, and then what about the privacy of information that's more likely to be shared by users with bots? So lots of studies have shown that users, if you have sort of this you know, computer program that has personality and is you know, cute and friendly, that you're more likely to share sort of personal information uh, with it. Um, and so this, this is going to happen, right? And so what about that privacy of that information? And what about misuse of sentiment analysis? So we can see, get a lot of ben uh, benefits and insights from sentiment analysis. And so, I mean, should a manager know that, you know, develop, developer, one developer is kind of pissed off today, you know? Should they know that? Or, you know, but maybe it's good if they know the morale of the group overall. Maybe that's okay. So sort of thinking about those questions. Is it okay to kind of have bots that stalk you and kind of watch what you're doing, right? I don't know. Lots of questions here, and I think we need to think about this one. Um, and then be careful what you wish for. Sometimes the bots uh, work better than you might anticipate. So this is just a bit of humor. <laughs> um, so Tay is, uh, sorry Andy, it's a Microsoft <laughs> bot that kind of went wrong. <laughs> uh, it was a Twitter bot, and she was designed to learn from uh, other users, actually she was designed to learn from millennials, you know, younger people, and to learn how they converse and then to sort of mimic how they converse and, you know, sort of improve, right, as she learned from other people. Unfortunately, she learned a bit too well, and this was actually one of the most tasteful examples I could find from the web. Um, but she, uh, you know, she learned how to be racist and, you know, how to say sort of insulting things, and, um, and uh, so they had to, you know, kind of shut her down, right? So sometimes, you know, your bot, if you have it learning, maybe it can, you know, do better than you think and, and turn something that was supposed to be a positive, right, into a negative. Um, and when not to bot, um, so title of my talk, find it together. Um, information and interactions, of course, with when you're using the bot are not discoverable, right? So they're hidden behind these commands. You have to go and look at the commands or you have to learn how to speak to it. I mean, even okay, some of the conversational US are really good, but as we all know from using Siri, um, you know, it's, it doesn't always work right the way that you think. When we got um, Apple TV, my husband and I, and you know, I was saying, oh, Siri is so great. And he's like, you know, mousing through all these menus and you know, I go into the room and he's like, oh, I can't turn it off. How do I turn it off? And I pulled up Siri and I said, Siri, turn, turn Apple TV off. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> and my husband went, see? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't always work, right? Even when you think that the conversational UI will work. So how to work with it are not discoverable. Um, the interactions may be more ephemeral through these tools as well because you're using them through this messaging platform and they disappear, right? Especially if you've got too much going on. We have that problem all the time in our group using it. And perhaps there are reduced opportunities for serendipity and learning from other people because they're being replaced with these uh, interactions through bots. And direct manipulation is just better for some complex tasks than others. Um, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're buying clothes, you might prefer to use an app, right? Because you want to look and see what are all the options, right? If you want to buy a scarf, what do they all look like? If you don't care and you want somebody to do your shopping for you, then a shopping bot is the way to go, right? There's this cute scarf. I think you'll like it. Great. Buy it, right? Um, but for some kinds of tasks, you know, where you're trying to choose between things, direct manipulation may be better. And they may bring new disruptions and complexities themselves. So on the one hand, they seem to be addressing some of the disruptions and addressing some of the complexities, but now they bring their own set of uh, disruptions and, and complexities with them. Um, actually, um, uh, Achara et al. and uh, Chris Parnon and Emerson Murphy Hill are actually looking at that issue uh, through their tool called Code Drones that try to monitor sort of notification overload and, and, and dial it back if, it's, if there's too much happening. So what about some research opportunities? Well, um, uh, bots are actually a great test bed for experiments. So some of us in this room, you know, we love to experiment, right, uh, with our tools and the AI things that we do. And so the bots give us a way that we can actually experiment uh, with those with our users. Um, and I got this quote actually from this book, and I brought the book because um, I was reading more of it on the plane. And uh, it's called Bots, the Origin of New Species. I don't know anybody seen this book. I ordered it, um, and I was a bit nervous because it was written in 1997, and I thought it would not be relevant, you know. It, it is. It's kind of relevant. There's actually a lot of really interesting stuff in here. So if anybody wants to sort of browse through it, you can, because it's not available digital copy. Otherwise, I couldn't show it to you. You know, I can't 
share of those that book. Um, and the other thing with bots is that maybe it would ease adoption, right, of uh, the software engineering um, tools that we do, right, because we can sort of insert them easily into their messaging platform. When I first started doing um, develop our, uh, research with tools and building tools with developers, it was so hard to get developers to use these new tools, right, because you had to take them out of their environment and get them to use this tool, or you had to write a plugin for Eclipse, which is a lot of work, and then Eclipse would update, and then the plugin would break. But you know, now you can kind of break down the features that you're interested in exploring and then deliver them through this kind of microservice approach through the bots, through the messaging platform that developers are using. So I think we're going to see a lot uh, improvement of experiments. <clears throat> and of course, you know, in terms of research opportunities, it's, uh, you know, we have to ask how these virtual team members may impact uh, global software development. Right? So what kind of role are they going to play and how are they going to actually impact many of the issues that are prevalent? in global software development. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the quote from Fred Book Brooks about adding manpower to a late project will make it later. So um, this is just kind of a closing <coughs> question that I have. You know, Will adding bot power to a late project make it later, or will it help? I don't know. Uh, something to think about. So that's my talk. Um, so I talked about what's a bot, and how bots play a role in SE, and how to enhance them, risks and opportunities. Just a brief summary, because I kind of went fast. So there were the dimensions of bots that we looked at, so what they do, how autonomous, intelligent, and how we interact with them, and so on. And software development bot roles, the different roles that we see, uh, from coding and testing and su supporting users and so on. And a productivity framework that I'm just kind of putting out there as a kind of a first step in this to look at, well, what really are the benefits from using bots? but also calling for research to look at you know, when they should be used and when they shouldn't be used and how we could use them. Maybe they go to work for us, right? So uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>Skeptic in me looks at this and says, you know, this is just mm -hmm. commit hooks and scripting with a, with a yep. new name. Yep. Except, I remember about a decade ago, I let some a uh, uh, couple of my friend's kids use Eliza. And they were really, really trying to get Eliza to tell them why her dad wouldn't let them get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it, and your comment about how you interact with a bot that's completely useless. Yeah. But for some reason, there's... There's something there. There's a satisfaction. So yeah. I, I was wondering if you could speculate that maybe that whether the um, popularity suddenly of, all of these bots is because they tap into some kind of um, yeah, yeah. emotional response. That, that that's control. the theory. But yeah, absolutely. That's I've read some. Some. I mean, it's, it's conversational user interfaces have been around a really long time, and I mean these comp, these chat bots, right, have been around a really long time as well. But it's just suddenly kind of you know come on the scene again because now we have access to all this big data and we have uh, better AI and we have better natural language processing right, tools that are out there. And uh, a lot of the discussion about that is that it is tapping into something innately human. And if we think about how we've interacted with computers over time, you know, we started with punch cards, right? And then, then the, the terminal window and then you know, we would you know, type in the command line and then we had the, the graphical user interface. And now they're saying the conversational UI is kind of the next step in that evolution because it's closer to how we interact with other people, right? It's closer to the way that we, you know, converse and, and think about doing things. So that's kind of, that's the theory. And so it's interesting to think about how that's, if that's going to play out, and it actually seems to be, I mean, it has limitations, but it seems to be working in some places. Um, how that plays out in software development. And software developers are using these bots. So I'm not making, I mean, I kind of stretched a little here and there. But, uh, but I'm not, I mean, there are plenty of examples out there. Thanks for the question. Hi, um, I have a question okay. over here. Yeah. So it seems like the bots enable you to parse conversational interfaces, and the frameworks enable you to sort of connect people to the bots and perform these particular actions, but at least from the last time I ever did AI, which was probably back in college, was 
I could parse sentences, but I didn't know what they meant, and I didn't yeah. really have any semantic framework. And yeah, yeah. unlike Eliza, I probably couldn't easily turn yeah. your English into a response. Yeah. Like, what kind of expertise do people need to be able to really build bots other than yeah. a dream? Yeah. Like, do I need to go find a Zork developer from like 1985 and ask yeah. them to yeah. come work for me to do this? Yeah, no, I mean, this is a really good, I mean, this is the fundamental AI question, right? You know, I mean, real intelligence is not being able to solve a task that you can easily define, right? But actually for the bot to be able to, you know, understand a task that it hasn't been programmed to do, right? Or understand a problem that it hasn't been programmed to solve it. I mean, definitely we're still kind of at that, you know, we're not, at, we're not there, they're not there. They're not going to, you know, just magically write your code for you or test your code, right? Um, they, and and I, I didn't put this in this slide, but one question I ask is, you know, do bots address, you know, Brooks, I love Fred Brooks, right? Um, do they address the accidental complexities or the essential complexities, right? And I think a lot of what they address are the accidental complexities, but in terms of scale, they do address a lot of the scale issues, right? So in terms of, you know, dealing with users and awareness about what's going on in the team and, you know, even, you know, translating, you know, between a developer in India and a developer in Germany, right? That's pretty powerful, right? Um, is that a bot, though, or is it just translation, right? So the, the bot is the interface to, to these services, and I think these services are kind of where you ask how, is, how good is the AI, and then the bot is just kind of how they bring that to the user and how that plays it in the messaging platform, so, yeah. I'm not answering your question because I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, a very interesting talk. Uh, more like in my research management in, in my group and, and together with the collaborative projects, I feel there's strong need of uh, the role the bot would play there. I mean, as you hinted on, on scalability. Mm -hmm. So I manage a bunch of projects with so many students mm -hmm. I work with. I mean, uh, in the university setting, as a research advisor, one important goal is training, right? And right. Besides getting things done, getting yeah. the project done, getting yeah. whatever the tools or the research projects. Then I spend a lot of time interacting with students, mm -hmm. dealing with their fundamental skill, how to communicate, right. how to abstract. Right. Uh, I could feel quite some of them could be automated or with some tool support at least. I mean, the some bot would be more agent, interacting with them first, right? Clean yeah. that their thoughts so that they could better think about how to communicate with the yeah. advisor and then my time is more expensive, right? And, yeah. and yeah. so I think in that sense, I mean, I think it's very important in terms of training. Yeah. Uh, along with, I mean, for example, in my group, I use Cheryl, I mean, yeah. along with Slack. I mean, yeah. I started using Slack. Then I already feel I couldn't keep up with this, I mean, warning, I mean, message with the task completion for me to monitor. I mean, it's not a whole lot of projects, exactly. but still, yeah. I mean, scalability is a burden yeah. on yeah. me, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if a bot could help reduce the burden, that's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's potential, but I think that we're not there yet in terms of really realizing it. I use Slack in my own research group, and um, whenever we're working on, you know, a paper or a project, we have, you know, code commits coming in the code channels, and we use bots for scheduling meetings, and we use bots for um, my students doing progress reports and to remind them that they need to do it. And then the, the way that we use the channels, I mean, this isn't bots, this is more the messaging platform. It brings a lot of awareness, right? So we share um, readings and so on, and then they see, oh, I should read this and I should do that. I, it's definitely, in terms of my research group, improved the productivity. Um, but then there, there's the thing of, well, how do you keep up, right, to all these notifications? So I still think, you know, that we need to do more, there's a lot more research we need to do uh, to really understand, okay, when does it break, you know, and what could we do? How could we add a bit more intelligence in there? We won't get where Andy wants to go, <laughs> but, you know, we could make them a little smarter, right? Mm. Oh, um, hi. So you touched on effectiveness and decision making. You have any experience with bots supporting creative processes, like building on the ideas of others, suggesting yeah. new things, stupid yeah. things, I mean, also improving the team dynamics? Yeah, that was actually my question to the keynote uh, speaker yesterday, because he mentioned using uh, bots to schedule meetings and to book the, the place, and I said, well, what about in fostering innovation, right? Um, I don't know of anything that talks about that per se, but I think actually the HANA Cafe, if you, could, you could maybe make that be an environment where you could experiment with that, how they could enhance creativity. I mean, creativity is a really hard thing to nail down anyway and to measure, right? Um, but 
Uh, definitely the way that I've seen, uh, certainly the messaging platforms being used, it, it enhances it. What I could imagine is like using machine learning algorithms yeah. to mutate, I, I mean, not coming up yes, with own ideas, yeah, but just yeah, yeah. to twist them, mutate yeah. them, yeah. Or new ideas. Yeah, or bring in things that are similar to what you're asking about from another field, right? So sort of going out there and searching, because that's what we do, right? When we want to be creative, we go and we search in other disciplines, and then we bring in those, those, uh, those resources. Yeah. Great talk, Peggy. Thanks a lot. Um, I see a number of, of uh, application domains also for for uh, yeah, the day-to-day -day academic life. And what I wonder is, I mean, when I, for instance, want to compile a bot support system that supports me in my teaching, then I don't want to sit four, five, six weekends in a row scripting stuff together. So um, do you have experience or do you have any overview research uh, surveys or whatever on what development environments, something well, like domain-specific languages or something like yeah, that? Yeah, there's if you Google, you'll find lots of different platforms. I mean, I, the, the Slack, um, what was the book, the Slack book that I mentioned, that's one framework you could use. Um, I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't know for sure which is the best one to use. Um, I know that when I used Ubot in my class, I spent two days trying to get it to work, and that was like over a year ago. Now I think it's easier. So there's a, there's always this hurdle, right, when you try to use new stuff that it doesn't just work the way you think it should, right? So, but we're getting there, I think, right? We're getting more and more frameworks, and you know that would be a really cool research topic, though, to look at how bots could play a role in teaching, right? Because we we, we spend so much time doing the same things, right, over and over again. Good, good suggestion. Okay. So just one more question. When I think about bots, I'm also a little bit skeptical because I kind of think, well, sure, I've seen this idea before. Yeah. But <laughs> in 1997, and I'm breaking um, the place, sorry. <laughs> but in the place where bots are kind of taking off is Siri and Cortana, yeah. where it's a conversational bot, but it's out loud. Yeah. Do you think that these kind of bots could be done out loud, or do developers not want to talk? Like, and this also goes to what Tao was saying about teaching the students how to talk yeah. and how to ask questions and how yeah. to get their ideas out. Yeah. That's all verbal things. Those are yeah, all things yeah, that yeah. are done outside, not just typing into yeah. a computer. Yeah, yeah. I think they would, yeah. I think so. Why not? Typing's faster. Typing works with people who are, you know, asynchronously working or who are not co-located, right? So they'll type. Um, but, you know, Slack, Slack, for example, has integrations with Google Hangouts and Skype, and a lot of people do that. They'll just say, hey, let's open a Hangout. And, and it's be because it's so easy. I mean, that's not a bot. That's just an integration, right? But because it's so easy, people do it. You know, and, and it's lowered the barrier to actually having that verbal conversation with each other. Um, but in terms of talking to the bots, I, I don't see why not. My friends that are not in technical fields talk to Siri all the time. It blows me away. <laughs> Except my husband. <laughs> he doesn't do it. So, um, so where do you think the limits are going to be with this sort of anthropomorphic? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we, we've seen Clippy yes. be a massive failure. And yes, and Bob. Yeah, so there's some things yeah. to learn from that about yeah. Yeah. how much do we actually want to talk to computers who yes. pretend the humans are not. Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, the, he talks about, uh, I think, or maybe it's somewhere in something that I read. I read it, something about Bob and Clippy. And I mean, the reason Bob failed was because it treated people like they were stupid. Um, and Clippy kind of had the same effect with people. It didn't quite get it right. Um, but I also read, and I can't remember where I read this, but Clippy had different, um, uh, different avatars, I guess. So you could make uh, Clippy be a cat that would purr you know, when it was happy and stuff like that. And people reacted very differently to the cat that was basically the same agent right, as Clippy. Um, so very subtle differences lead to the success or failure. And I didn't talk about this a lot, but you know, just like people or animals, the, e the habitat, right, the environment where they are, really matters, right? Um, so if you're in something you know, that is more playful and kind of hipster, you know, it might be OK to have a bot that kind of talks that way. But if you're you know, in something that's more formal, it wouldn't be OK. Right? So very, very subtle differences will play a role there. Um, but you know, it's, some of them are working. And they're, you know, like my students were saying how much they love Poncho, the weather bot. 
So they check the weather more often than they used to now <laughs> because of Poncho. Check and check her, him or her. I don't know which. Uh, I also want to thank you for fascinating talk, and I hope this round of questions isn't just blurring you down after. The no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope I remember them all because they're really good questions. Uh, I should have asked you to write them. It's been a very nice talk, so, and, and your question and answering is uh, uh, very inspiring, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, one, uh, one thing that, so a couple things caught my uh, eye or ear in uh, the uh, thing. One, uh, on your documentation, Bob, where you talked about the visual analytics and what mm -hmm. uh, So we're doing that, and I never thought it was a bot. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we're not doing it in the context of software development. Okay. Okay. We're doing it in the, con we're doing it in the context of uh, healthcare applications, right. where we have uh, therapists all over the country who uh, are oh, doing telemedicine cool. uh, applications, and yeah. uh, we have infrastructure. We have uh, therapeutic consults in people's homes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so uh, they do get the they do get visual analytics. Uh, they do get. Uh, uh, which are they just they don't ask they are just you know provided um, and then they make decisions about you know, uh, changing the uh, care protocols. Hmm. Uh, so um, is it is it through a conversational UI? Uh, it's not. A, we didn't try to make it conversational in the sense of uh, have the therapist talk to the system. <coughs> so if you will, it's a bit more One way. conversation. Well, it's can yeah can yeah yeah. And that's a point that I was kind of uh, leading up to. Uh, just a sidebar on the creative box. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, the visual artist Harold Cohen, who recently passed, uh, built a conversational art making system called Aaron. And the uh, composer David Cope uh, built a uh, system for uh, making music, which is made over a thousand compositions, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of which have been performed. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout. So mm -hmm. uh, they both do AI yep. uh, based yep. uh, aging systems. Uh, so uh, sorry for the long. Uh, no, I comment. think I guess Toby's probably writing down those links. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, David Cope for music and uh, Harold Cohen mm -hmm. for art uh, with Aaron A A R O N. Um, so look, my where I wanted to get to is so what is not a bot? Yeah. You yeah. know, if I have a command line interface yeah. to an operating system, is that, yeah. Um, you know, uh, it it carries on a conversation with me. It's not yeah. a natural language, but it's a language we quickly learn yeah. how to correspond with. And yeah. so, uh, I, I I guess what I'm trying to get at is. Uh, is bot just sort of a new way to talk about, you know, old wine? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and that, I was trying to actually make that point a little bit, and maybe I didn't make it strongly enough. I mean, that, that was one of the questions I asked, you know, is it command line, you know, a conversational UI, is it a bot? Uh, we've talked about this in our group. Um, it's certainly on the continuum. It's, I mean, all of these things are always sort of like a continuum, right? And, you know, you know, I've been in software engineering for quite a while, and it's like, oh, we thought of that 20 years ago. You know, it just wasn't trendy then, right? But you know, is it just that it's trendy now? I don't know. It's sometimes it's just the time is right for something that we've been doing all along. I did a lot of research with scripting languages, and I thought they were the coolest things since sliced bread. And um, you know, and in particular for interacting with visualization systems. Um, and you know, but my users didn't use them. Right? They, they didn't take, except the power users, they wouldn't take the time to learn how to, how to write the commands, to do this, these amazing things that they could do with the visualization of their data. And, uh, but maybe through the conversational UI, which you know, we were sort of talking about, you know, what, make, what makes Clippy fail? You know, this kind of, you know, this sort of anthropomorphic piece, you know, at what point does it actually make people kind of break down that barrier that it kind of <laughs> triggers something in their brain that they think, I can do this, you know? So, I, you know, I think there's something going on there that people are also seeing the conversational UI in other places, right? I mean, everybody's going to now have it in Facebook. 11,000 bots are coming on Facebook. Um, well, most of them will, but a few are coming, <laughs> and a few are there. And, um, uh, and actually, I think there's already millions of users using them. Um, 
So maybe with that change, right, uh, and sort of in readiness towards technology, then they will start, you know, more people will start using those, those interfaces, right? So yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, I, you know, that's what I'm asking. You know, what is a bot, really? You know, it's, it's not something I didn't give a crisp definition because it's just, it means so many different things to different people. So maybe more just a style? I think it's more of a style. It's more of a, you know, putting a conversational UI on machine learning. The essence is not what they do, but how they do it. It's more how they do it and how it's used. Yeah. Well, I wanted to Thank you. I, I mean, I'm struggling with this myself, right? I, I wanted to challenge that, just that yeah. notion, because you put Felix up there. Yeah. Which, the command structure is yeah. almost exactly It's like a command line. A, a pro, it, yeah, there's a yeah. program called todo.txt that yeah. uses almost yes. the same syntax. So yeah. that's not conversational at all. No, it's not. But Felix has a personality. Yeah. It's you know, person, yeah, and, right. and that's the key difference. I mean, yes. and I, I think it yeah. goes back to Thank something you. more about emotion than yeah. functionality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So per, we can't leave personality out of it. Yeah. It, it, it's completely manufactured. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. The question is, uh, which I have is around. Do bots have a continuum over the value chain of construction as opposed to a script which is very specific? How do you see that play out uh, as opposed to you know, just a point yeah, intervention? Yeah, yeah. It's, and the systematic uh, integration of the, the chains of yeah. inputs across, do you see a, a way that they get linked up? Like you know, if you say Facebook's got 11,000 bots, yeah. do they have a, a back end where they, they live off each other, or does it everyone live individually? And um, you know, therefore, you get a much richer response or a much better guidance in how it takes you forward through this mm -hmm. progression of value creation. Mm -hmm. Great questions. A um, couple of really good ideas in there, right? Like, we need to do research maybe that looks at that, right? That kind of progression. <coughs> and in terms of the bot to bot, I mean, a lot underlying the bots are microservices, right, that the bots will use, right? And we just mentioned one there, right? Um, in terms of the bot to bot interaction, there, there's, I think there's some cases of that happening, but that's just starting, right, where the bots will talk to each other. And, and I think sort of understanding how that plays a role and how that brings value is great forward research. You know, I, I mean, yeah. Whatever the bot is, <laughs> you know, and we're, we're still trying to work on that. Um, maybe as a group we can come up with a definition. Um, whatever that is, it, a lot of it's been around for a very long time, right? And it's just that now these things are coming together and they're starting to be adopted. But there's very little research on really understanding what kind of value they bring, right? So I, I think there's great opportunities there for studying that. More questions? It was a, uh, it was a uh, great presentation. Thank you. And I, I was thinking uh, these bots are uh, software uh, that uh, work on another piece of software, especially say for example you are scheduling a meeting uh, by using a bot. Yeah. So uh, we're already struggling with anomalies of a software mm -hmm. and these bots work with uh, another software. If these bots have anomalies like bugs, so you are working with buggy software with another buggy software and how this effect will get multiplied yeah. and uh, especially if they work in a regulated environment yeah. like healthcare and that can become a, a serious issue uh, of validation uh, and uh, that's one. And second question is uh, 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 software is validated by human experience and uh, human uh, judgment mm -hmm. uh, often. Mm -hmm. uh, but how will they validate the uh, correct functioning of these bots? Mm -hmm. Because they work on another piece of software, which itself is right. uh, not a uh, fully validated. Yeah. Piece. I mean, the qu the questions that you're asking, I think, just apply to software, right? Software as a service, right? This issue and services use other services. Um, but I think what you're what you're getting at is the fact that will users maybe maybe I'm maybe I have this wrong, is that because it has this kind of personality, will users somehow trust it more? And actually, they do. Um, and how to sort of address that and how to do testing. I think Tao is interested, right, in this topic um, of how to do the testing of this and to address these very issues. So there's a whole line of research on that. And then in terms of, you know, hu human perception and believing buggy software more easily because it comes with the personality, 
is a really interesting question. I and mean, you could set up a really lovely experiment with that, actually. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, I think, which is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do people trust Siri more than they trust just Google? I don't know. <laughs> but she could do something. I don't, yeah. I'm sure there are probably some people doing research on that. And if they're not, they should be. Really good question. Oh, I think I have a question for myself. Okay. Uh, uh, do you know any theory from psychology that can explain why people like more to have this kind of conversation? And yeah. uh, if it, there is any difference between general population and software developers in how they want or they like to interact with this kind of conversational bots? Yeah, very good question. There are theories uh, from psychology. I can't think of any names of the papers, but I've seen references to them that look at this in terms of the general population. I don't know of any that look at software developers versus you know sort of other people. Although I like the quote, you know, developers are people too. But <laughs> 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 but you know maybe maybe there are little, some of, some of them are maybe a little different. I don't know. <laughs> good good question. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any more questions? I think some developers might prefer typing Com commands. I, I'm just sort of pondering about this, and I'm thinking maybe this fits in some sort of context of augmented cognition or something. Yeah. Like yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Definitely. This definitely fits in augmented cognition yeah. and cognitive. You know, there's a whole field now, right, on cognitive thinking and so on. IBM is very big into this. I'm sure IBM is actually doing some very uh, interesting research on yeah. these questions that we're asking today. Yes. Um, but, you know, they haven't, at least when I search, I don't find a lot in software development context. So and it's almost as, as though maybe we've gone to some plateau where we're more comfortable with yeah. augmenting ourselves with um, a technical environment. Right. And more prepared somehow to let that talk to us. Yes. That is. Yeah. It's a really interesting problem. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's tons of research on that, and, and, there, and as uh, Marco asked, there is research on sort of the conversational UI from the yeah. psychology perspective yeah. that shows that, right? And it, and it goes beyond just this sort of willingness to interact with it, it's, more, it's so much more than that. Yeah. You know, there's a willingness to share your information, you know, yeah. your, your private information, even when you know it's a bot, yeah. and to say thank you, you know? And some <laughs> of the bots will say back, it's, there's no need to thank me, it's my job. You know, <laughs> but the person will still say thank you tomorrow when you get the weather forecast. You know. Very interesting so, talk. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. No, any more questions? So let's thank Peggy for the wonderful talk. We have here a reminder from the organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks for the questions and the discussion. It was uh, really interesting. I have to get right it all down. <laughs> yeah. And Tobias also asked me to give you this. I think it's a kind of a summary of your talk. <gasps> wow. <laughs> Who did this? Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Beautiful. That is lovely. I'll, I'll frame it and put it on my wall, actually. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. And we have two announcements. Uh, first, if you are not going to Google tomorrow, Please let let our front desk know. And second announcement: If you are a presenter in the in the technical session after the coffee break, please identify yourself to our order that you be the session chair and be prepared. And thank you again, Peggy. Thank you.